Loving Father, we pray now that what I say and what we think in our hearts and minds will be pleasing to you. We pray, Father, that you would speak to us through your word, and build our courage and our resolution to trust in Jesus alone. In his name we pray. Amen. Have you ever asked yourself, where did we go wrong? <laughs> where did we go wrong? I have, on many occasions. Maybe I've had a difficult conversation with someone. It blew out, went in a direction that I never expected it to go, and I thought, where did we go wrong? Sometimes it's a helpful question. It's a question of reflection so that we can learn and do better the next time. Sometimes it's just a question that comes from exasperation. It's too late. The damage is done. Where do we go wrong? Um, I, offer, I ask that almost every time I play, play golf. I'm not much of a golfer, but I do play on occasions, and I think that's my problem, actually. I don't play that often. And so when I do play, I ask, where did I go wrong? Um, I'm the type of golfer that thinks that they're better than their scorecard. And uh, the scorecard's okay, except for a few blowout holes, a few double bogeys, gentlemen's nine, or just golfer nightmares. It's just, I was doing fine till then. And I think to myself, where did I go wrong? The driving was straight, the putting was on target, ah, it was a sand trap. I never did learn how to use a sandwich. I should have avoided the sand trap. Always. I mean, really, when I think about it, where did I go wrong? It was the moment that someone suggested we have a game of golf and I said, why not? <laughs> That's where I went wrong. Today in this passage, we see in Numbers chapter 13 where they went wrong. It's a critical point for God's people. This is where the short journey blows out to be a 40-year journey. It's a disastrous moment. It's where they went wrong. This is the land that the Lord had promised. I wonder if um, we could put up a slide here, which is an outline of the message with a picture of a grasshopper. That's the way that they felt in uh, light of the people that, that were in the promised land. We're just like grasshoppers. But remember, firstly, that it was the promised land. It would be theirs. So if you have your Bibles open, turn to Numbers chapter 13, verse 1. And there we read, And the Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving the Israelites. They were on the edge of their new home. It was the land that the Lord swore to give them. It wasn't theirs to earn or to fight for. It would be a gift from the Lord. And they had every reason to trust the Lord. He'd secured their escape from Egypt in a most miraculous way, splitting the Red Sea in two, allowing them to pass through. He guided them. They followed the pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. He provided food and water in the wilderness, manna from heaven. And when Moses complained, how am I meant to feed 600,000 men meat? The Lord delivered quail from, uh, blew a wind into their camp and the quail literally piled up at their feet. Amazing. All of this was tangible evidence that the Lord keeps his promises and provides for his people. And now he would give them the land. But first we have a fact-finding mission. A person from each tribe would go to explore the land. And Moses said to them, here's their terms of reference in chapter 13, verse 18. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they ward, unwarred or fortified? How's the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring some fruit back from the land. This is a mission not just for fact-finding, but for faith-finding. They would find the land just as promised, ready for their taking. 
However, rather than leading to faith, it led to a bad report. The spies spent 40 days exploring the territory and as the spies returned to the community, they made their report. It started with the good news. It's just as promised, rich and sticky, flowing with milk and honey. And here's the fruit, a huge bunch of grapes that two men had to carry. But don't get too excited because then we have the bad news. They report the people are powerful and the cities are fortified. They effectively report it might be good land, but good luck getting it. Look, but you can't have it. I do that often when I go shopping. I look, but I don't intend to have it. And when the shop assistant asks me if they can help, I just, I, what do I say? I'm just looking. <laughs> just looking. I've got a habit of looking at surfboards. I just, I'm just looking. I look at them on Marketplace, they're for sale, but I'm just looking. I don't really intend to buy them. You know, that's a good one, that's a good board, that will help me. That will help me to go to the next step. That's the sort of board I need, but I'm not going to buy it. And Bron will often ask me, what are you looking at surfboards for? What do you need another one for? She doesn't understand what it's like to be surfers. You know, I mean, she looks at it's not as if when you go out surfing, you take five boards with you, do you? You just take the one, but what she doesn't realise is you need one for the different conditions. <laughs> she said, what do you need another surfboard for? And I must admit, our garage is small and we already have eight surfboards in there. <laughs> but what's one more, right? But I'm sure I'm not, I'm not going to buy, I'm just looking. Just looking. And often when I'm looking at surfboards on Marketplace, I feel like I've got to sort of hide my <laughs> iPad so that she can't see because I can't stand going through the third degree every time I'm looking at surfboards on Marketplace. What are you looking for? I'm just looking. That's what they said to the Israelites. You can look, but you can have. Caleb gives his minority report. He says, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Caleb gives hope. Perhaps there's some faith among them. However, the majority report wins the day. Caleb says, we can, but the others said, we can't. You can look, but you can't have it. They say in verse 31, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And the bad report is spread among the Israelites. Notice how the report has changed and paints an even worse picture. The reports that the land devours those living in it. It doesn't provide food for you to eat, it eats you. And it reports the size of the people. Not just some of them, but all of them are of great size. The report of the presence of the Nephilim the renowned giants from that ancient tribe before the flood. They report, we seem like grasshoppers in their presence. We seem so much smaller than maybe the way Jimmy felt when he faced Joey's in the basketball comp. The bad report exceeds their mandate. They were just asked to go into the, to the land to report what it's like, the inhabitants, not to express their opinion as to whether or not they should attack. Nevertheless, they made their mind known and the whole community complains to Moses. Their lack of faith infects the whole community. And this leads to 40 years wandering in the desert. An entire generation will die out and none will be allowed in. It's a tragic tale. They had a choice at this stage, to listen to God or listen to the spies. And they chose the bad report. Where did they go wrong? Well, firstly, they doubted God's promises. This was not a spur of the moment plan. Remember that the promise went back to Abraham 500 years. It was exactly as the Lord had promised Abraham's descendants in Genesis chapter 15. 
Psalm 106 is quite a fine, it's a wonderful psalm, have a read of it at some stage, but it sort of sums up what happened at this stage. And psalm 106 verse 24 summarises it perfectly when it says, They despised the pleasant land, they did not believe his promise, they grumbled in their tents and did not obey the Lord, they did not believe his promise. Remember, God doesn't make promises lightly, He only promises things that he intends to keep and the scriptures prove that he is reliable. Yet this group spurns God's promises and refuses to trust and that's a dreadful thing to do. It's essentially making God out to be a liar or worse still, a dreamer. You know, all the talk but can't deliver. I don't know how you feel but this story (laughs) makes me want to grab these guys and say, do you realise what you're doing? Do you realise that you are treating God's promises with contempt? Can't you see the folly of your actions? But not only did they doubt his promises, they doubted his power. Can't put it better than Psalm 106 verse 21 where we read, they forgot the God who saved them, who had done great things in Egypt, miracles in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds in this, in the, by the Red Sea. The Lord had proved over and over again that he could and would overcome any obstacles to their salvation. Escaping the promised land, providing food for millions of people in the wilderness, protecting them against their enemies and guiding them all the way. Nothing proved impossible for the Lord. And uh, that would show to be true later in Numbers when the enemies would shake and tremble at the sight of the mass of people traipsing through their land. The king of Moab complains in in Numbers chapter 22 a people has come out of Egypt, they cover the face of the land and they've settled next to me. And as far as those giants are concerned, the the supposed Nephilim, otherwise known as the descendants of of the Anakites, The people would complain, who can stand up against the Anakites in Deuteronomy chapter 9? But in Joshua chapter 11, we'd read of a report where where, uh, Joshua and his army destroyed them a generation later. Where we read in Joshua chapter 11, at that time, Joshua went and destroyed the Anakites from the hill country, from Hebron, Debir and Anab, from all the hill country of Judah and from all the hill country in Israel, Joshua totally destroyed them and their towns. Who are the grasshoppers now? Huh? The people's fear was unfounded. It was all in the way they perceived themselves and their enemies. They focused on the obstacles, the size of the people, the strength of the walled cities. They were focused on the giants. And we're overcome by fear rather than focusing on God and his promises and responding in faith. And they doubted God. And you think to yourself, what a pity. What a pity. You see, there are many dangerous things in this world, things that can threaten our survival. But here we see the impact of unbelief. See, it was devastating. The New Testament uses this as a warning to God's people today. The letter to Hebrews was written to people who were struggling to follow Jesus and were taking his ministry for granted. And it warns them uh, so that they don't follow the same fate as the Israelites. And I'll read it out to you, Hebrews chapter 3. And it talks about those, um, who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out to Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? And then it sums up what happened, where did they go wrong? And so we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. And it provides a warning for us today, a warning against unbelief. 
The Israelites had Moses, but we have more. We have the miracles of Jesus, how he freed people from slavery, how he provided food for thousands and salvation for us by coming back to life. And in the end, it was Israel's unbelief that led to their downfall. So let that not be ours. In some ways, we're like the Israelite community. We're yet to enter our rest and we stand on the edge of the promise, the edge of the new heavens and the new earth, the edge of our eternal inheritance. Yet it seems so far and there's insurmountable hurdles in the way. Read the paper each day and you'll have no doubt about the rising cost of living. You might think one more interest rate rise and that will break the back of my budget. And there are health concerns, pressure in the workplace, relationship struggles. Often we feel we just need a little more, a little more energy, a little more luck, a little more money. And today we struggle against the worries of this life that rob our focus on Jesus, who showed that he overcomes them all. Today I'd like to ask you to reflect on the Lord's Prayer. We pray it sometimes here at church. And it's the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. By my calculations, there are six requests in the Lord's Prayer. Six things that we ask the Lord. I don't know, you do your own calculations. Maybe when you go home, just add them up with your fingers. I reckon it's six. But let's focus just on two of them. Two of the requests, two of the things that we ask the Lord in the Lord's Prayer. Firstly, we ask, your will be done. The Christian life is not about my will. It's not about pursuing my goals, my dreams, my satisfaction and security. We don't pray, my will be done. We pray, your will be done. The Lord is pursuing his will. It's where everything is heading and he knows how to get there and he invites us to join him, to submit to his will. And you might ask, so what is that will? Well, that's why we study the scriptures. The scriptures reveal God's will for his kingdom, his will to make everything new in Christ, his will for the gospel to be declared through all the nations as we just sung, his will for our church, that is that we love each other, and his will for our lives, that we are mature in Christ. His will trumps ours. So that's the first thing we ask God, your will be done. The second one that I want us to focus on today is lead us not into temptation. And we can see how those two relate. Your will be done, lead us not into temptation. Often we think that this is asking God to save us from the times that we're tempted to swear or to gossip or or, or covet things, do bad things. The temptation causes us to doubt the goodness of God's will and to fear the barriers. So we ask, if I do God's will, will I miss out on a comfortable retirement? Will my children be robbed of opportunities? Will I lose my financial safety net? Will I remain lonely or not realise my sexuality? Pray that the Lord will help us to face our fears and not submit God's will to them. Your will be done, Lord, not the will of the things that create fear and rob me of my focus on you. Your will be done. We need God's strength to not allow God's vision for us to be crowded out by those giants in life. They may may seem insurmountable to us, but with God, all things are possible. And we have the example of Jesus, who in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing that he'd bear the sins of the world and the shame of the cross alone, he prayed and he wondered if the Lord could remove the cup of suffering from him. He was on the edge of glory, but he knew he had to firstly fight the battle of sin on the cross. And he remained obedient even to death, death on the cross, 
which leaves us with his model prayer, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus did what the people of Israel couldn't do. He submitted to God's will, but the people of Israel succumbed to their fears and doubts. One commentator wrote, One group compared themselves to the giants, while Caleb compared the giants to God. Their lack of faith came down to their focus. They focused on the giants, the fortified cities, and they were filled with fear. fear. And for them, it was nothing but a suicide mission. But Caleb, he focused on the reliability of God's promise and the enormity of his power. The obstacles were dwarfed next to God. You see, they said, we can't. But Caleb, he knew God, he knew God's promises, and he knew he can. They say, we can't, but God can. And loving Father, we pray that we'd not fall for the same mistake that the Israelites did, that we'd not focus on the giants of life, but rather, Lord, we'd focus on you and your promises and that we'd side on the side of faith and that you would help us through this journey, this journey of life, to not fall for the temptations, the things in life that create fear and trepidation, but rather to trust in you, to remain obedient to you, to submit to your will, knowing that you'll get us there. Father, you know what you're doing. You're reliable, you're trustworthy, you're powerful. Father, convince us of that, that we may grow in our faith to the very end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, And I think Clem's now going to lead us in prayer. Thanks, Clem.